Peter is an old friend of mine. We've been working together for many, many years. Yes. We met each other in the Hearing Voices Network International, and you have been helping me in my services over many years. And Peter is a, is a very uh, skilled person, and I think you're one of the, the most skilled uh, the most skilled person about working with paranoia, actually, is we haven't talked much about how to help people with paranoia in Denmark. And Peter has, Peter has uh, a lot of. You set up the, the the paranoia network in England, and you have been running self-help groups for people with paranoia for many many years. So, uh, welcome to you, Peter. Thank you. It's an honor. Good morning, everyone. Can you understand my accent okay? Okay, if I speak too fast, like I said, just say, please, please slow down. Uh, I'd just like to thank Jorn and Anne and Psychovision for giving me the opportunity to be here. I've always been really made very welcome when I've come to Denmark over the years. So again, thank you for giving us your time. So my name is Pete Bullimore. I'm a voice hearer. I'm not just a voice hearer. I'm proud to say I'm a voice hearer. In my experiences, and I own them. I spent over 10 years in the psychiatric system, often forcibly detained under the Mental Health Act. When I first went into the system, I was told by a consultant psychiatrist, he said, Mr. Bullimore, you are a chronic schizophrenic. You will never, ever work again. Go away and enjoy your life. I think how does it actually work? But I'm now out of the mental health system. I've thrown my diagnosis away because I don't believe in the concept of schizophrenia because there never has and there never will be any scientific validity for that diagnosis. I'm quite happy to say that I'm a voice hearer. But I'm part of the Hearing Voices movement. I also run an organisation called Asylum Associates, which offers training, consultancy, we set up conferences, and I'm the founder member of the Paranoia Network in England. I do a lot of work with people, usually people that have been told that they can't recover, on average 70 to 80 hours a week travelling around the world, living, teaching on hearing voices, paranoia and childhood trauma. It's goes to show recovery is possible and psychiatry can be wrong. Now, when I talk about psychiatrists, I'm not just talking about psychiatry, I'm not talking about psychiatrists, I'm talking about every discipline that works under the banner of psychiatry. That's nursing, social work, OT, psychology, counsellors, support work. It's right across the board. I've been doing this work for about 18 years now, and at times I still hear some members of staff describe a long-stay patient by saying, that person's lights went out years ago. Well, I can assure you, a person's lights never, ever go out. There is always something burning inside that person, and it is the role of mental health workers to reach beyond diagnosis, find that person and reignite that flame. And we do that by creating hope, to foster hopelessness by telling someone they may never work again, make that journey to recovery very, very difficult. Everybody has got the capacity to recover, as long as we do not define recovery. Recovery is not defined by measured outcomes. Recovery is an individual journey. People need support on that journey. Part of that journey is going back to inpatient care. But look at the reduction in time. Last time you were here, Peter, it was six months. Now it's only three. What's changed in the perception of your experiences? What support have you received inside and outside of services? Always focus on what a person can do, not what they cannot do. Look at the resilience of human beings, things that may have happened in your lives, family members, friends, people you may support. What is it that keeps them going? If you focus on what a person can do and let them define their own recovery, people can and do recover, that's the important thing. So I want to look around, uh, around paranoia mainly this morning because out of all the years I spent in psychiatric care, the voices didn't bring me into services. It was the fear and the paranoia behind the voices that created the problem, based upon my abusive childhood. So I want to look at the three stages of paranoia, and then I want to look at a case study that might seem very, very complex. When we break it into the three stages, it starts to make sense. There's a lot of symbolism in there, which was just, just dismissed as delusions. Now, it's important to remember, you cannot work with paranoia the same as you do hearing voices. People make that misconception. It is polar opposites. Because you have the three stages of hearing voices. You have the startling phase. That's when the voices first start. It can be a very, very frightening experience. Imagine the worst anxieties you've ever had. Times them by ten. 
That's what it can be like for some people when they start to hear voices. Now, you have to get some appropriate interventions in at that point, because I've known people be stuck in the startling phase for up to 10 years. Then we have the organisational phase. This is an important phase. This is where you have to work on the whole body of the person, not just the voices. How are you going to integrate someone back into society when they may have been rejected for 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years? Then we have stabilisation phase, where we talk about living with voices. The three stages of paranoia are polar opposites. You do not want to be in the third stage. So I'll give you an example, then I'll look at how we can work through it in a case study. One of the problems we have in classical psychiatry is people focus on this, the behaviour. If you focus on the behaviour, you will never, ever understand the person. You've got to look at the thoughts and the feelings that create the behaviour. It's very, very important. So we'll look at this as the three stages of, of, of paranoia. You can see the thoughts have been the trigger, the feelings have been the conspiracy. Remember, there's always a threat in there, and the behaviour is the conviction. Now, what we're also going to look at this is, in paranoia, you have got to look for an alarm system. An alarm system precedes the triggers. That's the important thing. Now, cognitive behavioural therapy purists will tell you we always have a thought before we have a feeling. That is absolute nonsense. You can have a feeling before you have a thought, so it can go both ways. Have you ever woken up and felt anxious? Yeah? Then you don't realise why you're anxious until you think about what it is that creates the anxiety. So it can go both ways. But look how quickly this can cycle for someone. Someone might say, they've just looked at me in a strange way, are they sniggering at me? It might seem there's something that seems very, very quite innocuous. And then we have the conspiracy, the feelings. I don't feel safe in this situation. I'm getting very anxious. I want to get away. They're definitely plotting something. Now the social withdrawal starts. Now remember, when you're working with paranoia, keeping up the social functioning is paramount. It is very, very important. Because when you get to the conviction stage, which is behaviour, I'm going to hide away, I don't feel safe around people. The person may go home, lock the door, draw the curtains and unplug the telephone. Okay? This is when it becomes problematic. But based upon this scenario, which of the above is a problem? That's the important thing. A lot of people will focus on the behaviour. It can be problematic, but it's not the problem. It's become the problem. With the three stages of voices, you want to be in the third stage. The three stages of paranoia, you do not want to be in the third stage. You need to be identifying the triggers and the feelings, the thoughts, the conspiracy, very, very important, and then we start to take action. But even if someone is in the behaviour, which you will find many people do, cycle very, very quickly. Use this as an example. The conviction is a story. What's happening now? You need to listen to that story. It doesn't matter how elaborate it is. There will be an element of truth in there. It's very, very important. Now, the conspiracy is the history. How have you got here? What brought you into psychiatric services? You cannot work with anybody in psychiatric care unless you have a comprehensive narrative because the experiences don't make any sense. If you've got a comprehensive narrative, elements of what's in that behaviour will be in that story. And then the trigger is the past and the present. You have to determine the relationship between past events and present experiences. That's the important thing. So we're working in a polar opposite way as what we do with hearing voices. So I want to work through the, the, show this case study. And they say you'll look at it and it looks very, very complex. I used to work with a, a psychologist called Terry McLaughlin. He's passed away now, Terry. But to me, Terry was one of the greatest thinkers I've ever met. And he was so radical. In fact, the NHS wouldn't give him a job because he was too radical. But we used to get some very, very complex cases. And uh, this was a lady called Angie. And uh, she came to see us, and she'd been on, she was in her 30s. She'd been on antipsychotic medication since she was 14. At the first session, she said, I'm going to go cold turkey off my drugs. I'm going to stop all my medication today. And she was on a very, very high dose. And we, now we begged her not to, please don't do it. But she did it anyway. And the word she said, said next became very symbolic. She said, the dam was open. Those words became very, very symbolic. She walked into the local police station. She said, I'd like you to arrest me. I'm a paedophile. I abuse children. And I video it. So you've got some real problems there. She had a very, very supportive network. She started to systematically take them apart. She also told us that there was a man that came to her flat at 10 o'clock every Friday morning. He knocked on the door. She opened the door, but she wasn't allowed to see his face. He came in. 
He changed around the cameras in the flat that he installed to monitor with. We could never find these cameras. He would take her into the front room. He'd lay her on the sofa. He would strip her naked. He'd have sex with her. Then he'd spray shaving foam inside her. And then he would urinate on the carpet. Urine is a big theme in here. She got up in the middle of the night and she went into the bathroom. And she took the, the side of the bath off, the bath panel. As she laid on the floor and started to roll around. A boyfriend came out of the bedroom, he was naked, and he said to her, what are you doing? She says, I don't abuse children anymore. I murder them, and I'm storing them under the bath. He looked under the bath, there was nothing there. He said, why are you rolling about on the floor? Well, I'm bathing in their blood to celebrate their demise. She accused him of having eight penises. She said, you've been having sex with me with an alien. She was a very, very strong girl. She picked him up and she threw him out of the flat onto the landing naked. At that point, he said, I've had enough. And he walked away. So she was systematically taking it all apart. So I'll give you the background to this. And it seems very, very complex. But when we break it into the three stages, we can start to make sense of it. Now, Angie and her sister were brought up with their mother, who was a heroin addict. At times, when her mother wasn't able to inject herself, Angie would have to do it for her. When she was seven years old, her mother died of a heroin overdose. Angie was never sure whether she administered the fatal dose. Their grandfather gained custody of them and began to abuse them. As he abused her sister, he would make Angie eat her at the same time. Now, he's making her compliant. It's a life trap. He's setting her up to think that she's part of that abuse by making her compliant by eating her sister. He would tell her he was a hypnotist and he would put a bar in her head so she would remember the abuse. After he's into the abuse, he would urinate upon her. Now, he's done something very, very significant here. This is animalistic. I'm marking my territory. Through the smell of urine, I will always know where you are, and I will always be able to find you. As she approached 14 years of age, her behaviour became very aggressive. She was placed in a school for dysfunctional children. Whilst in there, she was given large doses of antipsychotic medication which she continued to take for many years. When she was 21 years old, she got into an abusive relationship where her boyfriend would play mind games with her and frighten her. When the relationship broke up, he told her she'd never be free of him. For many years, she became increasingly frightened and paranoid and was admitted to psychiatric services at the age of 26, where she received a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. She had long spells in hospital, Whenever she tried to talk about her experience, she was disbelieved and told it was part of her illness. At the age of 33, she went cold turkey off all her medication and handed herself in to the police, telling that she'd been abusing children. She became convinced that a man would enter her flat every Friday. She was not allowed to see his face. He chained around cameras installed to monitor her with, strip her naked, have sex with her and spray shaving foam inside her. He would then urinate on the carpet. She became very fearful of police and psychiatric services, refusing to engage with them as they were part of the conspiracy. But the police took no action over the abuse charges. They did look into it, but they said there is no case to answer. Now, someone presents you with all this, and it's very, very complex. Where do we start? So we decided to break it down into the three stages. First of all, we want to look at why would she think she's convinced she was an abuser? The answers are in here, and ages in here are very, very significant as well. You've got to keep an eye on the ages. Quite often, we've probably got workers in here and you probably won't be able to do this, I'm just telling you what we used to do. After some of the sessions, she'd be very, very stressed and she'd say, I could do with a beer, Pete. Come and have a beer with me, will you? So we'd be sat in a bar, we might be there for 60 minutes. And then she might just go, Pete, can you smell piss? Very significant. You need to do something at that point. And also, sometimes if she got into the conspiracy stage, she would feel frightened and powerless. What action would you take at this point? Now, you've got to bear in mind, we were seeing somebody one day a week. There's another six. What can you do to bring in to keep her safe? What can she decide to bring in to keep her safe through the six days? The last one was very, very complex. This is, it's, it was Terry that came up with an answer to this. I, didn't, I, didn't, I would never have thought of doing what he did. She's come when this, this man comes to her flat every Friday. How could you help her make sense of this belief? Now, maybe he is. We need to be realistic. We need to check it out, OK? So we've got to be very, very careful. So when the first one is, why do you think she was convinced she was an abuser? If you look at the narrative, it's in there, isn't it? She gave her mum heroin. Did I kill my mum? It's a question she'll never know, an answer she'll never get. She was made to hate her sister while 
the abuse is going on. It makes a compliance, what we call it, it's a life trap. It's how abusers set you up. So in the context of this, it's all true. But quite often, when we'd be, we'd be sat in the pub, and every so often she'd go, oh, Pete, can you, can you smell piss? What would you check first? Are we sat near the gents? I'm sure the ladies smell very nice, I've never been in them, but gents' toilets can stink, okay? Can I smell it? That's the important thing that you, you need to check out. I couldn't. So what you need to do at that point, it's very, very important, you need to assess her emotional age. It's very, very important. She's in her 30s. If she regresses to being seven years of age, which many people do, she's got no control. I can't smell urine, how old do you feel now? She said, I feel seven, like I'm seven. You've got to get out of that environment. It's very, very important. You've got to get her back to the age of where she is now. Otherwise, she'll have no control in that situation. You also need to look at what's been going on in the last few weeks. What we found out from was it was a time of year when the grandfather gained custody of them. So there's a lot of symbolism in here. People will regress. Quite often, when you're working with people, you'll switch, see a switch in body language. Just say to them, at this moment in time, how old do you feel? And you'll get, I'm five, I'm seven, I'm nine. You have to explore what was happening then in the years prior. It is very, very, very important. When we looked at, um, we looked at the conspiracy stage, we have to bear in mind, ask her who she could refer to in a time of crisis. Let people start to build their own support networks. It's, it's very, very important. So when we're talking about we're not challenging beliefs. Now with Angie, we could find nothing positive in this belief system, but some belief systems we're not going to take away. We're going to make them secondary because they're a protective factor. Now, the police have looked into this. They've looked into it extensively. They've got to. She's handed herself in. I've been abusing children. I video it. But they've found no, they've found no, they've found no evidence. All you're trying to say is, you know, if they found no evidence, you know, maybe, maybe you weren't in a, a child. Maybe there's something else in here. You're trying to raise that element of doubt so she'll look at a belief system. It's very, very important. But the big one was under conviction. Now, it was Terry that came up with this. Now, we, we, we've been there many times. This guy comes at 10 o'clock, so we've arranged to be there at 10 o'clock, and no one comes. But the goalposts move very, very quickly. It's probably, you probably will have experienced this, some of you yourselves. You know, you leave at 11 o'clock, you stay for one hour. You get back to the office and they ring you. Oh, he saw you come and leave, he came after you'd left. Those goalposts, they move very, very quickly. So you've got to be very, very bit more proactive. And uh, Terry just said to me one day, he said, you know what I really like about Angie Pete? He said, um, she's engaging. You can see she, wants, she can see she really wants to help. So he called her and he said, Angie, part of your recovery is not us coming to see you, it's you coming to see us. So that's okay. He says, come at 9.30, Friday morning. Well, this guy comes at 10. She can easily say I went home and he came later. I never, I, he never told me what he was going to do. I would never have thought of this. She was there at 9.30. We just sat chatting informally for 15 minutes. At 9.45, she said, he just said, Oh, Angie, do you want to you want your coffee before we start? She said, yeah, all right. He says, come with me, Pete. There's something I want to discuss, you, discuss with you. Well, we went out of the office, but Terry went straight back in. And he just said, Oh, do me a favour, will you, Angie? If anyone comes looking for us, tell them we're busy. We're not seeing anybody else this morning. Is that okay? She went, yeah, okay. And he went, and he closed the door. He went, don't go anywhere, wait here. And we got, he got us both stood outside the office door from 9.45 to 10 o'clock. It's the same day, and it's the same time, but it's a different environment, okay? He got to 10 o'clock, and he hit that door harder than I've ever, ever seen anybody at a door. Now, if I come and knock on your door this evening, when you've opened that door, before you invite me in or send me away, you've got to do something very specific. What would that be? What do you have to do before you go away, Peter, or come in? What do you have to do? You have to identify me. How do you identify me? You have to look at me. Okay? She opened the door and she looked him straight in the eyes. And he went, 10 o'clock, Friday morning. How come you've opened the door and identified me? That's a light bulb moment for all, but it's also a warning for us. It's a warning that we haven't got all the narrative. At that point, you have to gain more trust. At that point, you need to back off. We have to remember, you can't assume trust, you have to earn it. What we did at this point was, we, we went and did the Maastricht interview for thoughts, beliefs and paranoia on it. And what we found out was, 10 o'clock, Friday morning, 
was when the grandfather gained custody of her and the daughter and he collected them. That's what she doesn't want to see. That's the important thing. So you'll only get so much, you have to back off, you have to gain more trust, and then you can go back to explore what it means for that person. They won't give you everything straight away, especially when you're working with paranoia. But the interesting thing is, what do you think the bar could be that the grandfather put in her head? This is why ages are very, 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 very symbolic. I'll just go back. What happened to her when she was 14? Something very significant happened. She went to the children's home, didn't she? What did they do to her? Large dose of antipsychotic medication. The medication becomes the bar. It blocks out all the abuse that grandfather's done. What did we beg her not to do? Stop her drugs. In her own words, the dam was open. All that ritualistic abuse came flooding back. Now, people would say she had a flashback. No, she didn't. She had a flash surfacing. Bang, she's back in that moment. All she can see is two girls being abused, urinated upon, and one hitting the other. But she, by witnessing that, she makes her compliant, so she hands herself into the police. So it all makes sense in the context. If we just call it a delusion, it makes no sense. But what about the shaving foam? Again, look at the ages. What could the shaving foam be? It's symbolic of something. It was seen as a delusion, but it's symbolic of something. What, what would that be? What happens at the age of 14? It's puberty. Paedophiles don't like puberty. They would shave her and her sister to make them look younger so they could continue with the abuse. So in the context of the narrative, it all starts, it all starts to make sense. But if we just see it some, as some kind of delusional framework with no backup or narrative, we never help the person get to the root cause of it. That's the important thing. Because when we look around alarm systems, now it's important that alarm systems are related to circumstances that become the trigger. Now, if she smells urine, what thoughts will that trigger in her mind? It will trigger thoughts of a young girl being abused, urinated upon, and being made to feel like an abuser. Triggers are significant. In paranoia, you've got to look for the alarm system. You identify the alarm system, that is when you take action. You take action at the alarm system, the thoughts are not triggered, you don't get the disempowerment of what a child would get. Because when we talk about irrational thoughts are what we first react to, with the thoughts are rational when the initial threat occurred. I think the use of irrational thoughts is rude. I really do, we shouldn't use the word irrational thoughts. Because if the underpinning problem has not been dealt with, those thoughts are not rational, they're perfectly rational on the events that's happened in the person's life. Because it's very important, we know trauma goes away, but thoughts and memory remain. The situations stay in the brain and they're very, very easily activated. Now, a negative response for people saying, your thoughts and your beliefs are not real. A positive response for, when were your thoughts and beliefs more real? When did they start? About 12 years ago. Can we explore what was happening 12 years ago and prior to that? And as Carl Rogers said, it's important, the relationship is more important than the therapy. That is so true. It's a great quote from Carl Rogers. Man's inability to communicate is a result of his failure to listen effectively, skillfully, and the understanding to another person. You've got to listen and you've got to hear. We cannot work with anybody with interpretation. What we think doesn't matter. You can only work on facts and the truth. That's the important thing. I've been assessing CBT students for over 10 years. And uh, it's a 30-minute video assessment. They interview someone with lived experience, and don't get me wrong, some of them are very, very good. But some of them make a fundamental error. They come out, there's myself and two other assessors, and we say, you've, you've made a mistake, what was it? And they can't see it. Okay, talk me through it again. They set the agenda, they finish with the homework. What mistake have you just made with the homework? No, Pete, you've got to set homework in CBT. I'm not knocking that, that's fine. You never bothered to ask your client whether they can read or write. You made an assumption. If they can't read or write and you've set them homework, the chances are they will disengage from that, from that therapy. Then what do we do? We blame the person for disengagement. If somebody doesn't work with us, we've got to look at ourselves. What is it about me that this person doesn't want to work with me? So the relationship is more important than the therapy. Because if we continue to focus on the behaviour, it's a vicious circle. It just goes round and round and the threat stays in the middle. But if you look at breaking the cycle of threat, quite often when people start to get paranoid, they get an increased arousal and they become hypervigilant. Now a lot of people will be hypervigilant throughout the year. Look for a switch in the seasons, dark mornings, dark nights, the hypervigilance will, will go up. I'll give you an example, it's quite a few years ago, I was going to work in London, I live in Sheffield, so it's like a two and a half hour train ride. 
It was November, it was dark, it was damp. I got up at 5.30 in the morning and I walked down the steps where I live. And I saw a man coming down the road. So I'm aware there's somebody walking behind me. Call that a healthy paranoia. I know he's there. It takes me 30 minutes to walk to the train station. This man never once tried to walk past me. And he followed me into the train station. I don't think yeah, it's coincidence, it's fine. He, stopped very, he stood very close on my shoulder and he watched me buy a ticket for London. Then he bought one. And he sat opposite me on the train and he never spoke. Well, it's just coincidence, I'm trying to play it down. I got off in London, I jumped on the tube, and he jumped on the tube, and then he went and stood behind me. So I'm thinking, ooh, have we got a bit of a conspiracy here, what's going off? I got off at Holborn High Street, and so did he, and he followed me down the street. And I stopped outside this train, and he walked past, and he, and he smiled. But I'm perceiving it as a smirk, why is that bastard smirking at me? And he carried on walking, there's two ways I can go with this. I can try and rationalise. Apart from my wife and Jackie Dillon, who I was working with in London, nobody knew I was going to London. How would he know to walk down the street at 5.30 in the morning? Would a layperson pay £256 on the day for a ticket? No. If I go the other way, no, they wouldn't. But somebody in authority might do. Where's my fear of authority come from? being sexually, physically and emotionally abused by two women and a man from the age of five up to 13. Trauma goes, but thoughts and memory remain. They can be very, very easily activated. Now, if I don't make sense of that and I go the other way, it becomes an emotional overload. Now, with the emotional overload, people tend to socially withdraw. But that social withdrawal acts as a retreat and protection. But responses from workers and family members at this time is very, very important. That person may be isolating themselves in the bedroom, not wanting to come out. Now, if that person is just perceived as lazy, come on, you need to get out and do something. You can't stay in here all day. And they're put under excess excessive pressure. But you don't know what that belief system is because you haven't asked. And that belief system is, if I go out there, someone's going to shoot me in the head. So if you're the parent that loves me, or the worker that says you care, why are you trying to put me in a place of danger? All that will happen is that social withdrawal will continue to be a treat, retreat and protection. You won't break that cycle. But if you look at breaking the cycle, when you're working with people with paranoia, it's very important, clear, supportive, positive communication. Be very concise in what you say. Slip of a word, it might get built into something that you didn't mean. Then help them try and make sense of ideas and beliefs. I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a friend of mine, he's called Peter. And uh, a few years ago, he got a section under the Mental Health Act. But where we are in Sheffield, there's no, there was no beds. So they outlaid him at a place called Harrogate. Now, this guy is a fantastic escapologist. Within 48 hours, he's on the run. Eventually, they caught him, and they brought him back to Sheffield. Well, I, I know his psychiatrist, and he rang me, and he said, will you come and see your mate? We've got him here. So I went up, and the room was full of people. And as soon as I walked in, my friend says to me, hey, Pete, did you hear I escaped in Harrogate? So I says, I have heard. He says, well, when I was walking through Arrogate, Pete, I saw the Queen of England. And she was driving along in a little mini. And it had a Union Jack wing mirror cover on it, so I stole it. He said, She's got, she, she only got out complaining. He said, all right, argument with Queen at Miller Arrogate. And all sat there shaking their heads. And this guy's lost his coat. And he says, I'll tell you what you don't know, Pete. He says, I have found the Holy Grail. I'm the only living person that knows where it is. So I've put my coat over it. So when the second person gets there, you know, I was there first. What do you think to that then? So before I can say anything, this psychiatrist says, I told you your friend's very unwell. And I said, no, he's not. You don't know why he's here. He's got psychosis. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I heard you the first time. Stop repeating yourself. He's not unwell. Let me explain something to you because you haven't bothered to ask. In the last, in the last 12 months, including both his mum and his dad, five members of his family have died or committed suicide. He's lost his job. His wife's thrown him out of the house. He's nowhere to live, and she won't let him see the children. This is all about loss. In this world where we are sat now, this man has got no control at all. In this world, he has. He can argue with the Queen. He knows where the Holy Grail is. You can't tell him he's wrong because you don't know where it is. <laughs> this guy needs very, very intense bereavement counselling because it's, it's not just about death. It's loss of identity, loss of being a husband, loss of being a father. Loss of being a provider. He's a very, very proud man. And I have to give respect to this psychiatrist, and I always will. 
He got in very, very intense bereavement counselling. A few months later, this guy, he was at our Christmas dinner. He, he wasn't right. He's still got a long way to go. But he was dipping his toe back into this world. But if things get difficult, it's a world he can retreat into to get the control back. So it's not all about taking it away, it's making it secondary where people can retreat. And then you can start to break the cycle of threat. That's, that's the important thing about it. But one, uh, what Bob was talking about earlier with, with the boxers, I think um, uh, Bob's a little bit braver than what I am. Um, he goes for the, what we call the landmine. I, I haven't got the confidence to do that. Um, so when I work with people, I kind of look at how many boxers there would be from the narrative, and I work from the easiest to the hardest. So I want to give you an example. It's, somebody, it's a little bit repetitious, but I want to show you how it was in practice, uh, what I've learned from Bob. Um, I'll give you an example. We've got uh, a young, young boy there, we'll say he's four years of age. And there's a next door neighbour. There's too many people here to pick a name. I don't like people using people's names, so I might pick someone's name. So we'll just call him the neighbour. And uh, this neighbour gets to know the little boy really well, and he gets to know mum and dad really well. He chats them all the time. And he sees the little boy in the garden one day, and he shouts him, Hey, come here. What? He says, How come your parents never go out? Never see your parents have a night out. Why is that? No one to look after me, no baby, sir. All right, just wondered. That's all he wants to know. And he holds that for quite a while. Then he gets chatting to the parents one day and he just says, uh, I've noticed you two never go out. Why is that? He already knows. There's no babysitter, no one to look after him. Well, if ever you do want a night out, I, I, I don't mind watching him. I'm not a drinker, always talking about video games and having a laugh company for me. Oh, a nice guy, Bob is. That's interesting. It's our wedding, that's our wedding anniversary. Uh, Next week, it'd be nice to have a night out. Let's, let's, ask, let's ask the neighbour. So they ask him. He has a little one. He hands him back. There's, there's no issues. The parents get chatty. You know, we both work long hours. Um, it'd be nice if we could just have one night a week out on a Saturday. Let's ask the next door neighbour. So we ask him every Saturday for weeks. There's, there's no issues. No, all he does is look after the little one. He sees a little boy in the garden. Again, and he shouts, him, come here. No, he says, where's your cat? I've not seen your cat for a while, who's your cat? Don't know, I think it's run away. Hasn't. Is it? No. No, it's not. Is that mound of earth over there? I've killed it and I've fucking buried it. You tell him and I'll fucking bury you. At that point, what he's installed in me is fear. As Bob said, it's the most powerful emotion we have. If you look at voices, paranoia, anxiety, panic, without fear, you've got, I haven't got a problem. The second most powerful emotion we've got is anger. Anger, not aggression, two separate emotions. So quite often when you're talking to people about their lives, they will get angry. Don't make an assumption that they're angry at you. If someone's been abused by a third party, they're not angry at the third party. They're angry at a parental role for missing it and allowing it to happen. That's about anger, not blame, two separate things. That's why don't parent people in psychiatric care or you'll become the figure of that anger. So he's got him now so he can start to do anything he wants. He starts to sexually, physically and emotionally abuse this boy. There's only two things he can do. One is he dissociates. The second one, he takes that fear, he puts it in that box, he closes that lid and he goes into denial. This is not happening. If I dare not look, I cannot see. If I cannot see, I cannot think. That trauma is in a freeze frame. His emotional development stops at four. The problem is it stops being a box. It's a landmine and it's here. And in later life, it grows and it grows and it grows. It doesn't go. So sometimes when you're talking to people, it could be a comment, a sound, a smell, something you say, something on the television, something in the media. They will regress to being that age. And again, as I said before, just say emotionally, how old do you feel? It's very, very important. What we're talking about here, we're talking about the can of worms. And we always say, don't open a can of worms. It's absolute nonsense. A can of worms is a can of worms that it's closed or it's open. If you don't open it, people don't recover. What you've got to do is you've got to open that box. You've got to see it through an adult size and that fear is irrational, it's out of date. Why do people use drinking drugs? They use drinking drugs to remove emotional pain. What you've got to understand, that pain is out of date, you're an adult, you're not a child. But why you need a comprehensive now, there may not be one box. If you were gonna do this on me, you'd find I've got nine. I ain't got one, I've got nine. I've gone through seven, so I haven't touched yet. So, the little boy starts to act out. Parents don't see it. This neighbor's not gonna miss it, he's, he's gonna keep watching. So what might he say to him to keep him quiet? You tell anybody bad things like, I'll kill you, I'll kill your parents, everybody, shut your mouth. This boy's, boy's really worried now. He thinks, I can't, I've got to tell someone. I know what I'll do. I'll tell my dog. Dog won't grasp me up. So he tells his dog everything and he feels relieved. 
He comes out of the garden one day and he's forgot to close the garden gate. The dog runs out, gets hit by a car and killed. So now he's lost his cherished pet, he's got another one. What did Bob tell him not to do? Sorry, sorry what did the neighbour tell him not to do? Don't tell anyone. So what, emo what emotions in that box? Guilt. Guilt is a very, very powerful emotion that will create negative voices. Voices are not just thoughts, voices are emotions. So he's, he's got him now, even more. So the boy starts to worry. What if I go to school and I accidentally tell one of my friends and they die? How will I ever live with that? The best thing is I'll not have any friends. I'll keep myself to myself. What, what happens to children when they isolate themselves at school? They get bullied. So you've got another one. This goes on for two years. He's only got one set of grandparents. They've always worked abroad. That had much to do with him. Become quite wealthy and retired. Come back to the UK. Can we have him at the weekend? It'd be lovely to, to get to know him. What result? Doesn't have to stop with a neighbour anymore. Fantastic. Grandfather takes him fishing every Saturday morning. He loves it. They go fishing one Saturday morning. It's been raining and the bank's quite slippy. Grandfather slips, falls in the river and he drowns in front of him. So now you've got another one you've got to deal with. You've got to go through these in a very, very systematic way. We don't know where we're going to start, but we know where we ain't going to start. We ain't going to start with, with, a, the, with the landmine, with this one, the big one. We ain't going to start there. All we can do is suggest. How would you like to speak about the bullying? <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about that one. What about your dog? Talk a little bit about my dog. You've either got to sweep that box clean or got enough shit out of it so the emotional development starts. It's very, very important. But you know when someone goes fishing and you put a worm on a hook, what does it do? It wriggles. That's what your clients will do. Oh, I'm not bothered what the neighbour did, Pete. I'll talk about my granddad. Classic avoidance. You're spotting the landmine. Very, very important. I'll give you an example. I was working with a guy in Brisbane a few years ago called Dan. 32 years of age. He has had every addiction you can think of. You have to invent another one for him to have another one. But what are addictions about, really? They're about avoidance. He will talk about anyone except his dad. He mentions his dad, he gets very angry. So I asked his mum why he never spoke about his dad. Now, he's very man, he's 32 now. She was telling me that when he was seven, he was driving through the centre of Brisbane with his dad, and somebody ran into the back of the car. So obviously, dad's got out to see what happened. The guy from behind, I don't know why he's done this, the guy from behind is from Australian Special Forces, and he's punched Dan's dad once and killed him with one punch in front of Dan, he's witnessed this. Now, his mum's lovely. What she did next, she never did with malice, but what she did was absolutely stupid. She said to him, your dad's gone to Jesus, he'll be back later, and he never went to the funeral. He's been waiting 25 years for his dad to come home. Emotionally, he's only seven. So what, what might he think? Why has why is he, he not come back? Doesn't love me, he's angry with me, it's all my fault. So with seven-year-old's eyes, he cannot deal with it. So I'll drink, I'll do drugs, I'll gamble, I'll sleep with anybody I can. Now what you've got to remember is Dan is 32. He's not seven. Don't treat him as a seven-year-old. He came in to see me one day and he sat down. I'll never forget, I'll never forget the next hour. And I just said to him, I've got something to tell you, Dan. Your dad's dead, mate. He ain't coming back, so stop waiting for him. He dropped his head on my shoulder. I've never in my life seen anybody cry like that in all my life. My shirt was soaking. He sobbed his heart out for an hour. Just two minutes before the hour was up, he sat up, and I'll never forget his words. He just sat up and he went, thank fuck for that, I can move on. It's very important. You, you, you've got to set him free. But what if you get a situation where the little boy that's there is four, he's now 24, but he finds out the neighbour's been dead for 10 years because of the fear they still control him. And I just want to show how I put the trauma trial, what I learned from Bob into practice. But I'll need you to build a visual image of this lady. It is very, very important. I got a referral letter from this psychiatrist to work with this lady. And I always have to travel. I've got to get a train to see this lady. And I'm, I'm sat reading this letter. That this lady's called Hannah. She's 31 years of age. She's got paranoid schizophrenia. She's got learning disabilities. And she's only got 5% intelligence. So I'm sat on this train thinking, why, why do I never learn to say no? What have I got myself into here? So I remember it was June, it was Saturday morning, and they live in this big converted barn. And I got there and the door was ajar. I've already got preconceived ideas of someone else's interpretation of this woman. So I knocked on the door and I stepped inside, and there was two women sat at a table. I thought, well, she's either not here or I'm in the wrong house. This lady gets up, she walks across, she went, Morning, I'm Anna. I'm thinking, ooh, it's not quite add up. 
So I sat chatting with her for about an hour. I believe she heard voices. I thought, she can't have got paranoid schizophrenia. If it doesn't exist, we'll get rid of that one. I thought, she's got learning difficulties, not disabilities. There's a massive, massive difference. And I thought, she's not got 5% intelligence. Whoever's under assessment's got 5% intelligence from where I was at. Now, when Anna was 14 years of age, she got raped twice by a family friend. And on both occasions, she told her mum and her dad. And they said, forget it and move on. We don't want the police involved. So at that point, whose fault does it become? It becomes Anna's. I've told twice. Nobody, it must be my fault. She lives with mum. Dad's dead. She hears three primary voices. One is a female voice. It tells she can't do what she wants to do. One is the voice of the rapist. One is more of an internal speech. It's a sister called Holly that comments on her in a negative way. Now, before you can actually start to work with Anna, you've got to have an explanation from her mother why she let her down when she was 14 years of age. As a 14-year-old girl, it is her mother's responsibility to keep her safe. I asked a question one Saturday morning. Can you tell your daughter why you let her down when she was 14? Believe me, them silence has gone on for a long time. Eventually, she gave Anna an explanation. I wouldn't have accepted it, but Anna did. The interesting thing, the female voice became less controlling. I think, oh, I wonder if this is linked to mum. I said, Hannah, does your mum stop you doing things you enjoy? She said, yes, said, what like? So, well, if some clothes are like, I see some clothes, if my mum doesn't like them, I can't have them. Anna, you're 31 years of age, tell your mother to piss off. But she can't, because emotionally she's stuck at 14. So Anna and myself, we went in the town centre, went in a clothes shop, I found the most hideous dress you have ever seen in your life. I said, Anna, I want you to buy that dress. She said, I don't like it. I said, well, neither do I. But I want you to come and buy it with your mum. Pete, I don't like it. I said, Listen, bear with me on this, Anna. If you come with your mum, what's your mum going to say? She said, I can't have it. If you buy it against your mum's wishes, and you take it home and it doesn't look very nice, what will you do? I'll take it back. There you go, you're thinking like a 31-year-old. 30, she went with mum, mum says, you're not having that. I said, I am. She took it home, it looked bloody horrendous. But she took it back. You've got a thinking chain, it's important. Now, what Bob was saying about the truth, trust and consent, you must have this for the next stage. What I said to her one day was, I said, Anna, I give me Saturdays up to see you. I'd like to bring a rapist into your front room. At that point, she panicked. I said, I don't mean physically, I mean through visualisation. When you identify other voices, all the gestalt stuff is very, very powerful. She says, I, I, I can't do it, Pete. I said, all right, we'll leave it. I left it a few more weeks. She said, um, OK, but will you keep me safe? Now, when you're working with people through these experiences, you've, you've got to empower them. It's very important you keep saying, are you OK to continue? Don't forget, we stop at any time. It's very, very important. I said, honestly, I don't we can stop at any time. She said, OK, so I, pulled, I was sat on a chair, I pulled up another chair. I said, give me a description of this rapist sat in this chair. She gave me a full description, and I grabbed him, got him. I said, you've got to trust me now, and I'm not going to let him go. I said, but how old are you now emotionally? She said, I'm 14. Straight back to being 14. You've got to get back to 31. So right, Anna, think in your mind, where would you put a 14-year-old girl to keep her safe? Now, not always, but quite often when you do this with young women, they'll pick a bedroom. Don't put them on the bed. Bad things happen to kids on beds. Put them on the floor. If they have a body flashback, they've got the grounding of the floor they can feel. Then ask them to name things they will bring in this room. You'd be amazed what they would bring in to create safety. So right, Anna, we've got a lock here. Let's lock that door. She's safe. The problem is, when Anna goes up there, she dissociates. When you dissociate, you cut off your senses. Primary senses are colours. You see anybody go in front of you. Just get them to name six red and six blue things in the room. So what you do with post-traumatic stress, you bring them back. So, right, Anna, how old are you? She said, I'm 31. I said, right, I want you to repeat after me between six and 12 times as a 31-year-old woman in control. And I want you to say to this rapist, what you did was wrong. I'm angry if you're doing it, and I'm going to stop you doing it again. Words she couldn't say as a 14-year-old. By the time she got to the eighth time, I never asked her to do this. She chose, she stood up. There's a power difference in the room now. I've got him. She's looking down on him. When he raped her, he looked down on her. I left her house at 2.30, sat the afternoon. That voice had gone, totally. It came back six months later. I got our first contract ever for doing the Maastricht interview in London. It was a six-month contract. Me being me. Oh, I can conquer London in six months. No, you can't. And uh, I gave Anna a job working for me, and we are coming home one Friday. We'd been down there solid for six months. She was very, very distracted. And I said, are you OK? She says, no, I'm not, Pete. She says, the rapist voice is back, and he's very angry. And uh, <laughs> scanned him there, they see. <laughs> I says, but let's not see this as a negative. I says, what, what do you think to this work, Anna? She says, I love it, but it's too much. And it was. At that level, we were doing it too much. How's that made you feel? She says, like I've got no control exactly how the rapist made her feel. That rapist voice has come back, it's an early warning sign. That's the important thing. You need to get control back within your life. 
I don't want you to take a month off work, don't worry about the wages, we'll pay you everything for a month. She took a month off work, that rapist voice went away. Every time the rapist voice comes back, it's about that she's losing control in her life. This is someone apparently with paranoid schizophrenia, learning disabilities and 5% intelligence. In just under two years, she passed a driving test. She's got basic maths and English from college. She still comes out doing the training for us, and she's got her own business making recovery jewellery. The interesting thing, the other voice, her sister, the internal speech, her comment on her negatively, actually said to her one day, who are you? She didn't recognise the changes in herself, so this voice didn't actually know who she was. So it is a very, very powerful way of doing it, but you have got to get the emotional development going. So I'll just uh, flick up there, and I'll just put this up. Do you want to say about that, uh, Jan? Okay, and so, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.